Good morning, morning. church. I thought for a moment I was off the hook because um, Pat had got a suit on. I thought, oh, there's another preacher this morning. (laughs) But I jest, I jest. What a wonderful morning so far. You know, what a rich morning. We've already, we've been worshipping in spirit and truth, haven't we? Thank you, musicians, for paving the way for us, but, and for everyone else for who's, who's shared. You know, God's at work amongst us. And it's, it, I feel very humbled, really, to be preaching from the word of God. You know, we have so much freedom, don't we? I did think of asking how many Bibles we own between us. Be an interesting exercise, wouldn't it? But it is, it is an honour. And some of the songs we've sung have been so relevant, haven't they? This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to us. And Estelle brought a fresh word from that. It's wonderful. So, let's get going. Except, actually, I don't want you to open your Bibles yet. Just hold fire. So any Bibles that are open, you need to shut them, even if you know what I'm preaching from. I'll explain in a moment. Um, But we do know that God's word is flawless. His word says that. And we, of course, are flawed, myself included. And yet we worship a God who wants us to become more like him. degree by degree. So as we journey through this teaching and preaching series of training in godliness, which Mike and Paul have set us on, I pray that God will be at work amongst us all, including myself, of course. He's rescued us, hasn't he? It says that in the Psalms. He's rescued us because he delights in us. And he's got amazing purposes for us. It is humbling, isn't it, when we think of it in that context. So, no Bibles yet. I thought we'd continue last night's quiz theme, and just so people who weren't able to be there could just get a little flavour of it. So I want you to pretend you have no idea what I'm preaching on this morning. Okay? And, you know, it's just, it's just a few questions on the life and times of... Well, it's a clue, Joshua. But don't open your Bibles yet. Okay, can, can we have the first slide up, please, Chiddy? Thank you. Oh, okay. It's pretty easy, isn't it? Straightforward. You'd be okay with this. Maybe easier than the questions last night, Andrea. Okay, so who'd like to come up with that? Who led God's people before Joshua? Moses. Well done, Chris. I thought you'd know. Okay. And what did God say to Joshua about the previous leader, just when Joshua was about to set... Yep, yeah. Moses, my servant, is dead. And Joshua, remember, was about to, you know, lead the whole of the it, it, God's people across the Jordan. Thousands of people. He'd got a big task about, you know, to, how, who, who, what a leadership role to take on, taking the people into the promised land and having to settle all the tribes in the right places. A massive, massive job lay ahead of him. Okay, now this is, the, this is why I didn't want you to have your Bibles open. I, I'm sure some of you have prepared for today and may have read it all. But I, I thought if this question came up last night, I think I know what three things I would have said. Mention at least three things uh, God, that should say, told Joshua when he became leader. Sorry, there's a key word missing there. <laughs> Mention three things that God told Joshua when he became leader leader. Who can think of one of them? Go on, David. Be strong. Be strong in the Lord. Okay. Yes. Okay. Anything else? Be strong and courageous, wasn't it? Yes. He said it more than once, I think. She, I, will be with you as I, was with I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. I think that's all in the first eight verses of Joshua. And then here's a clue for the other one. He'll give you the land. Yes. Yeah, give you the land wherever where you praise you. But I think those are the three things if my team had been chatting away would have come up with. I don't think I would have remembered what it said in verse eight. 
and which is all part of the same important um, instructions to and commands to Joshua. So shall we have a look at verse 8? You can open your Bibles now. You can put that on the screen now, Chiddy. Thank you. That's it. Do not let this book of the law, that's the first five books of the Bible, which Joshua had access to, um, depart from your mouth. Here's the word. Meditate. Meditate on it day and night so that you may, may be careful to do everything written in it. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, that Kenny brought this verse on Tuesday night, but he, he sort of gleaned different things from it than, than me, because God's word is living and active, and that's how it works. We can read that verse again and again, and God will speak to us differently. But um, the theme Mike gave for me to talk on today is, is meditating on God's word. And that instruction was given to who was going to become an extremely, you know, <laughs> focused leader with a huge task to do. And yet in the middle of those instructions of, of, and, and encouragements to be strong and courageous and that God would be with him and that everywhere he placed his foot, God also said, I know you're going to be jolly busy in this, in this new role I've given you, but make sure you find time to be focused on my word and meditate on my word day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, then you will be prosperous and successful. And that doesn't, obviously, that's not prosperity in, in the terms of money or anything like that. It obviously is godly prosperity, godly health, godly wisdom, etc., etc. So, I've lost my place already. That's what happens. Just bear with me for a moment. Okay. Now, of course, I, you know, I believe that those words apply to us today. Remember, you know, it's not just for a leader. We're a royal priesthood. We're a, every one of us who believes in Jesus is part of the royal priesthood. So those words, you know, since Jesus' day have been very much for us as well. <coughs> And of course now we don't just have the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, we've got 66 words, 66 books, inspired words to, you know, to help us really. You know, all scripture, all scripture is God-breathed and useful. You know it as well as me. For teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness. And we're on this theme, aren't we, of, of training, of training and getting deeper into God and closer to him. Now, there are people here who probably meditate on the word differently from me. If you want to know about Lectio Divina, which Mike talked about briefly the other week, talk to Sue. She uses it a lot. Is that right, Sue? Yeah, do people do it in different ways. I do a mixture of sitting in a chair at home with the word. Um, and I, other, sometimes I'm doing Bible study. You know, I love maps and dates and history, but meditation, meditating on the word is different. And, 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 and I think that's what God is, is calling us into in a deeper, a deeper way. And maybe we can share the different ways we do it. I love going for a walk on my own, you know, the solitude bit. I don't find that too difficult. I love being with other people as well. But I nearly always have a, at least a New Testament in my back pocket and my notebook in the other pocket. You know, and I sit and reflect outside. I find that very helpful as well. But you need to find your own way to, to meditate on God's word. Um, I, do you remember those of you that were able to be there on Sunday evening a few weeks ago? Mike, Mike shared with us the, the Hebrew word for meditate. Have, have you got it there? Uh, yeah, there it is. That's a Hagar. I don't know how you say it quite. Uh, I can't speak. I don't know if anybody can, does know the pronunciation. But, but I remember Mike sort of almost doing it with sound effects. Do you remember him talking about chewing over the word and, and really sort of enjoying it and muttering along as he was eating? And uh, it was a real, 
Um, and there is a sense in the Hebrew word that it, it, that it involves sound as well. And we do sometimes, you know, I don't know, when we're worshipping as, as well as reading the word, we sometimes, there is sound comes out of our mouth. And, 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 and it, when we're meditating too, we, when we pause and go over a phrase or a verse again and again, I believe God brings something deeper to us. I'm not saying I always do this. I'm just en I'm encouraging myself as well as you to, to, to think of these things. So I think everybody will know that uh, Bible meditation is not anything at all to do with weird Eastern practices of emptying your mind and chanting to reach some state of false ecstasy. Um, but rather it's about spending time. What a privilege to spend time in God's presence, filling our hearts, focusing our minds with the fullness of God's word. Pondering, listening to God, digesting it fully, dwelling on it richly, allowing it to become part of us, letting it nourish us, letting it change us. It might be one verse, one word that takes us into a different spacious place with God. Letting the word guide us, helping us to live our lives as God wants us to. So we flourish, I love that word, flourish and grow in the knowledge and love of him and we can be more effective for him on a day-to-day -day basis. So how do we get good at meditating? By, by doing it. Paul mentioned last week, how do you get good at running? By running and training. What, what's that gymnast name? Simone Biles, is it? Did you see her this week? Amazing gymnast, world gold or something. How she got so... She nearly gave up, didn't she, a couple of years ago. She went through... It's like... It, but let's bring it back to God. We need to persevere with these things. We need to keep going. We might start in the flesh. I think that does sometimes happen. I don't know about you. Same with praying. You start in the flesh, but you, you, know, you need to open your mouth to pray, don't you? And you might start in your own strength, but move in to the, let the spirit take over. And I think it's the same with meditation. We've got to find a space. I know it's easier for me. I live on my own. That's much easier than people with busy families. But we've got to make time and space, haven't we? We've got to find. Who was it? Was it, was it Wesley's mother that used to stick an apron over her head or something? Yeah. Yeah, or was it wife? I don't know. It's one of them, yes. I'm thinking to, that, that was her space, wasn't it? To commune with God. <laughs> Amazing. So, anyway, he, you know, we, we're talking about spiritual disciplines, and I think Paul mentioned last week that discipline sounds like a sort of a heavy word, a serious word. But I want, you know, I, it's not God's intent, is it? There is something good about routine and discipline, it takes us into a new place. But God, remember that a little bit of a psalm I think I just quoted at the beginning, he delights in us. He delights in us. And my heart and prayer is that we are so in love with Jesus that we delight in our relationship with him. I think there's another slide. And how I see, you know, getting really deeply into our Bibles, it needs to be a delight, not a duty. We need to rest and reflect as we read, not be rushing. I'm dreadful, I have my notebook by me, you know, I'm writing down the jobs for the day. I need to stop that, yeah, and thinking I must go now, I need to get on. We find time for all sorts of things, don't we? Favorite TV programs, we, we find time. We find hours of time for other things. 
my heart is that we, we really we would delight even more. I know some of you do delight in the world. I'm not trying to, you know, say we don't, but I think we can delight even more. What's the last thing? I've, yes, it's like immersing ourselves in the word. I think I've said already, you know, I love looking things up and checking the historical background and matching up years and things like that. But, or, or you know, I don't want to be thinking while I'm trying to meditate, you know, what, what I'm going to say on Sunday morning, you know, that I don't want to be looking for information for me. I want to be communing with God and listening to him. You know, there's plenty of examples in the Bible, plenty, and I've probably only got time for one or two, um, and, and Christians down the centuries, to, who, who have certainly teach us lessons on, you know, benefiting from this spiritual discipline of meditating. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just start, first of all, directly with the Bible. Some of you may have been thinking of it already, Psalm 1. Um, really, I just wonder if, if the person who wrote Psalm 1 had been meditating on Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 and God inspired him to write Psalm 1. That's, that's just me thinking about it. But I think it's, it's an amazing psalm. And the psalms are a great place, aren't they, to, to start your day with, maybe before you go on to other readings that you're studying. So blessed, blessed. Big word, isn't it, Blessed. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. You could do a whole sermon on this, or a sermon series probably. Or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. But whose delight, whose delight, there's that word, is in the law of the Lord. And who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water. I remember taking that photo and thinking of that verse as I took that photo <laughs> in the Lake District, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. What amazing things for us, isn't it, really? Whatever they do prospers. So I just think, I, I just want that to sink in more and more. We're blessed when we delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on the Lord day and night. It's an amazing passage to encourage us to spend time with God. There's a very good book, actually, um, written by Alan Hoare. I forget what he calls it, The Song of the Gate or something. It, something like that. It's Alan Hoare's coming, by the way, in November sometime. He's written many books, and he really goes deeply into the word. But there's one book. It's, just, it's a thin book. I've got it somewhere, or it's in the church library. Um, just on that Psalm 1. We're called, aren't we, to follow Jesus? And we know Jesus himself was able to draw deeply, to draw deeply on Scripture. Think of the time when he was facing severe temptation after his 40 days in the, in the wilderness, in the desert, without food or drink. You remember the three temptations? I'm sure you do. What's the first thing Jesus says when the devil tempts him? That's right, Chris. It's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Live on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And you can look up the other things that he said, but we know that those three bits of scripture that Jesus drew on all came from the book of Deuteronomy, from the first five books of the Bible. The same words that Joshua was told to, to meditate on. We need it in us don't we? We need it in us. Knowing scripture, knowing it in our hearts and minds really helps us because I believe the Holy Spirit will bring the right scripture to mind at the right time. I can remember when I was teaching, I was called twice, once to the deputy head and once to the head when we were running a, quite a, a big lunchtime um, 
session called Turning Point, which was run by Christians but was for everyone, and we had about 50 children coming at one point. I had to call Dan Hargreaves in to help us. But there were times when I was called, it, we'd got the permission, but there were times when questions were being asked. And every time I felt God was with me as I walked through the door. Because God says he'll never leave us or forsake us and the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. Now these are like many types of, you know, British persecution. Nothing in comparison with what's happening across the world in some countries. But God, he's, he, he's true to his word, isn't he? And he will help us in those circumstances. We're not to worry about what to say. At that time, you'll be given what to say, for, you, for, it, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your Father speaking through you. It's amazing. Thank you, Lord. And as I was preparing, I felt quite reminded of, of some of you will remember, two youngish women at the time who were so in love with Jesus um, and his word. Um, and they were ex-Muslims. They'd become Christians. God had revealed himself to them. And they trained in Turkey. But they were Iranian. And they went back to Iran. It's dangerous to be a Christian in Iran. And yet God, we know God is at work there. But those women were so in love with the word of God and so knew that people needed to receive it. They would go out at night and put, uh, in fact, the Bibles were smuggled in. I think they delivered something like, there's a little video in a minute, which will get it right, but I think they delivered 20,000. And they had a map. This is probably what caught my attention. Some of you know I'm a geography teacher. They had a map of Tehran. And over three years, they delivered 20,000 Bibles and put them in people's mailboxes. We'll watch the little video clip in a minute. But what, you know, and they ended up in prison, in Evin Prison, which was actually on the news the li night before last. It's a notorious prison. But let's listen. To, there's, there's actually a really long full uh, 40 minute. YouTube video where they talk with Nicky Gumbel. You can listen to the full story, but we'll just watch a little clip now, just really to know how deeply people love God's word and what, they'll, what lengths they'll go to. It was in um, March 2009 that one day early in the morning, Marzia received a phone call from a stranger. He had some question about the car document and asked her to go to the police station. And we didn't know why and what, what was going to happen. Um, but we just prayed together and she left, she went to the police station and I was waiting for Marzia to return from the security police. Suddenly I heard the sound of her with a few others behind the door. Well, I saw her standing there with um, three guards. And I was so shocked when they ransacked everywhere and they took both of us with all our belongings, like Bibles, Jesus movies, into the security police. We had long hours of interrogation. I, I believe it was in the first day that he threatened us to physical torture. In that dark cell in the basement, we just hugged each other. We said goodbye because we thought it was our last day on earth and um, we were so scared. I remember the only thing that we could do um, in that dark cell in those moments was just praying for each other. Uh, we met each other for the first time, it was 2005, and after finishing our theology courses, uh, we both felt that we had the same passion about our country, to return to our country and to share this message with our people. That's why even though we knew that how much is dangerous, we decided to go. And we uh, called our pastor, he was in uh, London, and we asked him to send uh, thousands of uh, Bibles. And uh, it wasn't easy for them, and we received uh, those New Testaments, and we started our first mission. And usually at night, we carried about 140 New Testaments in our uh, backpack and put them in the uh, mailboxes. I remember sometimes it was uh, during the winter, we had to walk 
for long hours, for about eight, nine hours. And after almost three years, uh, we could distribute uh, 20,000 uh, new testaments. There are some stories, amazing stories, that how God protected us and we could see his miracles. We were distributing Bibles, we were talking to people, and we were having these two house churches in our own apartment. And we knew that it was risky. We spent almost nine months in prison and 14 days we were separated. We were um, staying in solitary confinement. And I can say uh, during those nine months, we had almost about 10 trials, 10 courts. And in each court, the judges our, and our interrogators would threaten us to execution by hanging. And they, they wanted to put pressure on us to deny our faith in Jesus. We didn't have Bible with us. But uh, we learned how to live with the verses uh, of Bible. And every day we were praying and uh, asking God to give us uh, this power to live uh, those verses and to show him through, those, uh, uh, through our behaviors to prisoners. It was um, almost uh, at the nine months that uh, uh, we heard that uh, we, have, we had many supports from different uh, parts of the world. And because of all these uh, supports, the, the government had to release us, unlike their desires. And you know, Marzi mentioned about those Bibles that we were distributing. At that time, we were just praying for those Bibles. We didn't, we didn't know who would get those Bibles. And I remember uh, it was two years ago, we were in Australia, and we were invited to a church. After our speech, um, a couple came up uh, on the stage, and they were uh, both of them. They were crying, and they started to share their stories. They said that um, the wife found one of those Bibles that we put in, the, in their mailboxes, and they found the Bible. And the whole family came to Christ just by reading that um, New Testament that we put in their mailboxes. Amazing story. Amazing, humbling, isn't it really? We must treasure this word. It's powerful. It's God's word is so powerful, isn't it? It's funny really, I've, I, just before the service, I was just thinking as well, um, you know, what lengths people have gone to over the centuries so that we have the Bible in our hands in our own language. And I was thinking about all the difficulties people had in, so I'm looking at Pat, in, in getting it out of Latin into the vernacular, into English, so that ordinary people could understand. And that was William Tyndale, wasn't it? You know, and he, 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 he lost his life. He, he, he lost his life for, you know, in England. He had to move to Germany. And he, he actually printed, got Bibles printed in New Testament, print, translated into English printed in Germany on the German printing presses and smuggled into Britain. We forget that that happened in our country. So how much do we need to treasure this word? And those women, when they were in prison, they were feeding off the verses they knew. They were feeding off them because they will have meditated on them. So there's lots there, isn't there? I'd better move on quickly, really. Um, tonight, tonight we have the opportunity to be together again. Next training in godliness session based on uh, Daniel's life. And, 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 and probably this came more from me studying than, than, than meditating. But I wanted to share it because I think it's something that really must have helped Daniel. Daniel, as you know, most of you will know, you know, he was part of the people that were exiled to Babylon, hundreds of miles away from, from their homeland, from the, from the promised land. And, and he, he, he was young. He was probably 17, 17 years old when he got to Babylon. And yet he could take a stand, couldn't he, for God? And he did it in the right way. We, we looked at that last week with Paul. But if you go back into the, the, the dodgy kings of Judah, Daniel, when he was a youngster, he was brought up in the reign of one good king, Josiah, who reigned for 31 years. He, 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 was, he was very young, actually, when he started. But when he was a bit older, he, and there hadn't been a good king for 57 years before that, and there were really dodgy kings after Josiah, 
think about our center point children, you know. Daniel was that age and, and, and into his early teens when there was a good king on the throne. And there's a lovely, a, an exciting verse. There's an exciting verse. I think it's the priest talking to the secretary or something. But they say, we found the word. They're back in the, they found the word. They'd been neglecting it for, for so long. And Daniel was brought up in his homeland in an atmosphere of renewal and revival. No wonder he could take a stand when he got to Babylon. Because he'd been immersed He'd been immersed in the word. It's worth reading. It's 2 Chronicles 34 and 2 Kings. Somewhere. 22, 23. Something like that. And, and it, it, they, they do all sorts of things that they haven't done for years. And uh, it, it's um, just following God's ways bring life, don't they? So, um, so come tonight. <laughs> I don't know how, what Paul's going to say tonight, but it will be good for us, I'm sure, as we train in godliness and, and, and navigate to live our lives better in, you know, 2023 and beyond. I think we all know that neglecting God's word is an absolute recipe for disaster, whether it's individually or for, indeed for a nation. And I could go into examples of that, but we haven't got time. But I believe we must learn to keep feeding and reflecting on God's word individually as well as when we're together. Do you know what? It's a pretty simple an analogy, isn't it? What happens if we stop eating food, physical food? We, we will. We, yeah, we'll, I mean, you die very quickly, actually, if you don't have food. <laughs> and if we only snack on food or have an imbalanced diet, we're pretty unhealthy as well. So spiritual food, we all know, is vital for our growth and our relationship with God. Doing what it says will help us flourish and help us become what God wants us to be. And that will lead to eternal spiritual health and wealth. That's really what the prosper bit means, isn't it? We'll be like a tree planted by a stream of water and we'll be alive for God. I'm just going to show, I think, one more photo, because without dwelling on the word, you're right, um, Chris, we'll wither, we'll will, we'll die, and we'll become disconnected, disconnected from the source of life. You know, when someone dies that we're close to, we grieve, don't we? When people are disconnected from God completely, it's a matter of deep, deep grief. You probably grieve for members of your family that don't know Jesus yet because you know they're disconnected. God doesn't, the truth is, God doesn't want anyone to perish, so keep praying. But it, it was something about, you know, when that, um, could you just put the picture up? When that tree in Northumberland was willfully felled, there was like a sense of national grief, really, and I think it's just that tree that's been cut off and can't grow. It just reminded me of what God feels like when people are disconnected from him. And it's what we feel like too. God doesn't want us to be disconnected. So I think that's a, I hope that's an encouragement really to, to, to stay close to the, to the word and to spend time meditating. You know, you know some other examples. Mary, the sister of Martha, yes, remember that? Chose the better way, didn't she? She sat at Jesus' feet. I'm easily more of a Martha than a Mary. So I'm talking to myself here. We need to spend time with Jesus which, in his word, meditating. And all these things are written down for our benefit, aren't they, in the word? Think of the other Mary, or not the other Mary, a very key Mary, the mother of Jesus. She treasured all these things up in her heart, didn't she? I think that was after the shepherds visited. You know, these scallywags running down a mountain coming to see this baby. She treasured these things in her heart, pondered them. So the challenge to us is that we find time and space 
or that we continue to find time and space, or find more time and space to dwell on God's living word and to hear him in fresh and refreshing ways and maybe sometimes challenging ways so we can be all that God intends us to be. Let's get every morsel of goodness out of God's word. All the nutrients that are in it to help us to grow. Gives us strength, helps us to be more alive for him. Joshua, remember, was told to meditate on the word and do, and do. There's a doing word in there. What it said. We could have a long list here. There's some challenging things to act on as doers of the word. We're to go the extra mile, not begrudgingly. We're to give cheerfully. We're to keep no record of wrongs. We're not to go to bed angry. We're to pray for people that are not very nice to us. Let's have a hunger for God's word. I was encouraged as well, I read this week something from the Bible Society where prison chaplains in this country, prison chaplains in this country, are reporting that there's a greater hunger for the, wor for the word. He said, I take 10 Bibles with me every time and they all go, there's not enough. And our prison population is going up at the moment. You know, we see programs on, I'm probably digressing a bit here, but I, it's something about treasuring God's word, isn't it? And we're encouraged by that. They're running the Bible course in prisons. You remember we did the Bible course here? They've written a version for prisons. Let's pray for, for those in prison and those outside prison who are affected by those who are inside prison. You know, there's so much there to pray for. Anyway, I won't digress further on that, but... So our main focus this morning, I think you know what it's been, has been to meditate on God's word as one, as one of our spiritual disciplines. There are more. Let's just pray. Lord, we want to be people who very regularly quiet our hearts before you. and develop a deeper intimacy with you through your living and active word, Lord. We want to walk and talk like you did, Lord. Help us to know your ways that are higher than our ways, Lord. We want to say with all of our hearts, that we delight in you and your ways and that we will not neglect your word. Amen. Amen. Those last few words there, that we will not neglect your word, I think comes from Psalm 119. If you want them to say them with me, it's good when we say things corporately. I think it encourages us. Feel free to, to stand and say them, Chidi, there they are, yes, thank you. Shall we say that together? It's good to take a stand. Daniel took a stand. Let's go. I delight in you, Lord, and your ways. I will not neglect your word. Amen.